Well, I want to welcome everyone this Mother's Day weekend. It's so great to be with you. Moms, it's great to have you in the room. Uh, we do once again want to say you're awesome. And uh, most everyone knows that, but just in case someone needs to catch up to know how awesome you are, I got a story to help. Here, here we go. Every mom knows this. It says, I was out walking with my five-year-old daughter. She picked up something off the ground and stuck it in her mouth. Sound familiar, moms? I took the thing away from her and asked her not to do that. Why, she asked. Because it's been on the ground and you don't know where it's been. It's dirty and it probably has germs. At this point, my daughter looked at me with absolute admiration and asked, Mom, how do you know all this stuff? You are so smart. I thought quickly and replied, all moms know this stuff. It's on the mom test. You have to know it or they won't let you be a mom. We walked along in silence for two or three minutes, but she was evidently pondering this new information. Oh, I get it, she beamed. So if you don't pass the test, you have to be a dad. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now it is so good to be with you mothers, and, and we do know um, you are the glue that holds the family together, and we're grateful that you're a part of our life. Well, you know, we are going to talk today about forgiveness, and uh, I just want to encourage you as uh, we talk about this topic to dig in with me. And here's how I'd like to start. I want to ask you to think about the last time that you were hurt. I mean, we're really something happened in your life. You go, man, that, that didn't feel very good. That was painful. And I want to ask you to consider how did you respond to that? Now, was it something that you'd say, man, I responded really well, killed it? Or would you say, man, I think I need a redo on that? Here's what they would say. They would say that most of us are hardwired to retaliate when we've been harmed. You know, I want, don't want you to look at your spouse at this point. You know, that'd be bad in the middle of the message. But they would say that, that there's a popular philosophy out there that says this. I don't get mad, I get even. That's right. But we wouldn't say that. We wouldn't say like, hey, you know, when I am wronged, when something happens in my life, you know, I'm ready to get even. The truth is we have less direct ways that we withhold our forgiveness. You know, honestly, for some of us, you know, it's like we're really good when we get hurt at giving the silent treatment. You know, we're really good at that. We, we'll just go, you know, I'm not going to talk to that person for a while. I'm just going to kind of ice them out. You know, for others of us, it's kind of like we, we might take it on the chin when we're with someone, we get hurt, but we're already calculating. And when's going to be the opportunity for me to turn the tables? And when, when am I going to have an opportunity here? I'll get back at that person. Some of us are great at keeping score. You know, we're just thinking all the time, okay, okay once again, uh, that hurt, but I'm going to make note of that. I'll, I'll be back there. Others of us really, we, we can play the martyr, you know? When we get hurt, you know, we, we kind of act like it doesn't hurt, but we tend to make it a bigger deal. Can you connect on any of these? Are you, are you thinking about this? Well, if not, I have some other questions I'd like to ask you, maybe this will dive you in a little bit more. Think about this. Do you have someone that you can't stand being around? Do you keep your distance and pretend to be unavailable when they need your help? Do you complain to others about the person and desire others to join you? Do you tell the story of how you were hurt and embellish it with half-truths to draw people to your side? Do you constantly bring up past hurts, which are still fresh in your mind, no matter how long ago they happen? Or do you still make up speeches of what you were going to say to them or what you should have said to them? Can you relate to that? Anybody come to mind? You start thinking about someone, like, yeah, that, that, that's really painful. You know, that, that hurts, and, and all of a sudden we start having this temptation not to forgive. Now, here's the really interesting thing, is we don't hold ourselves to the same standard. I mean, that, that's the truth. You know, when we do something wrong, when we hurt someone, we tend to make up excuses for our behavior. It's kind of like the pastor who parked in the no parking zone 
because he was running short on time and he couldn't find a space with a meter. He decided that he would write a note, stick it under the windshield wiper just in case he got caught. And here's what it said. I've circled the block 10 times. I looked for a space. I'm going to be late to my meeting. Forgive us our trespasses. He came out after the meeting to his car. He saw a citation under the windshield wiper with a note from the police officer that read, I've been circling this block for 10 years. If I do not write you a ticket, I'm going to lose my job. Do not lead us into temptation. <laughs> you know, we do make excuses for our behavior. You know, we, we tend to say things like, you know, I've been under a lot of stress lately. Or, or we tend to say, you know, really, this is just the way that I am. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. We might even be as bold as to say, I really can't work with him or her. You know, unforgiveness is something that may seem subtle, but it really gives us away in our relationships. I want us to dig in the scripture and look at a story that Jesus offers. So if you turn in your Bibles, if you grab them or your smartphone to Matthew chapter 18, we'll look at this story together. I'm going to start with verse 21 and read to the rest of the chapter. Uh, you can follow along in your Bible or here on the screen. It says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of God is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. You know, Peter asks a question that most of us have wanted to ask, at least thought of. Lord, how many times do I have to forgive that person? And this is a legitimate question that Peter is asking. Because see, in the teaching in Judaism, they were taught that they only had to forgive someone three times. The rabbis taught this because they believed that if you continue to forgive someone, they may not truly be repentant of what they've done. And so they would teach this, you just have to forgive someone three times. Beyond that, you're not required. Jesus' response has to be interesting to Peter and the crowd. I mean, here Peter is being generous by saying, Lord, I would be willing to forgive up to seven times. But Jesus says, no, not seven times, but 77. Now, Jesus is not establishing a new legal standard. It's not like, well, you can forgive someone 77 times, but the 78th, well, you know, forget it. I'm not going to forgive you after the 78th time. This is a radical teaching that Jesus is giving the crowd. He's trying to help them understand what it would look like now to be a kingdom follower, to be someone that has encountered him, to be willing to offer forgiveness to be willing to do it for those that may not deserve it. And so Jesus goes into this story. 
And he gives a story about a king. And and the king at some point decides that it's time for everyone to pay up the debt that he's given. And so he calls this first servant in. And there in the NIV, it says that he owed 10,000 bags of gold. So at some point you ask, what does that look like? 10,000 bags of gold. How much money is that? You know, I studied this this week and scholars actually are divided on how much because truly a talent was a weight or a unit of money. It's kind of like a stock. And so depending on when this was written and all that, it may vary in terms of what it truly represented in our modern day equivalent. But this is what they would say. The conservative scholar would say that this man owed the king two and a half billion dollars. That's conservatively. If you took that out and others would argue, they would say, you know, that, that's really a conservative amount. We believe that this servant actually would owe hundreds of billions of dollars. A huge amount. Jesus makes this so extreme to really bring home the point. And it's interesting what this servant says when the king demands that he repay. Hey, just be patient with me. Give me a little bit of time and I'll be able to repay this. I mean, there's part of the crowd that would have heard this and go, you gotta be kidding me. This servant is never gonna repay this amount. He couldn't repay this amount in 100 years. Jesus is making the point once again. Man, this this debt that was owed to the king was so immense. You know, the king really had two things that he could do at this point. The one thing that he could do, as we see here in the story, is sell him and his family, everything he owed, he could sell it all off and regain some of that payment that he had credited. Or he could simply throw him into jail, debtor's prison. Everybody knew what debtor's prison was. It was a death sentence. Because when you were given over to debtor's prison, it was really the final straw. Like, we know you're never going to pay this back, so we're just going to give you over to jailers, and they'll torture you for the rest of your life. You have to live in these unpleasant conditions. You're never making it out of here. But here's what we see in the story. We see the king have pity. We see him have pity to the point that his empathy leads him to not only sit down and schedule a repayment plan to figure out how once again he can recoup some of his money, but he says this, you're free. I'm gonna take this debt, billions of dollars that you owe me, and I'm going to cancel it. I'm gonna tear it up. I'm gonna let you walk out of here. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if you owed that kind of debt And all of a sudden, it came to the point that you were to account for it. And they just said, man, you're out. You don't have to worry about that. I'm going to take that. I don't demand that from you. You would have thought that this guy would have went out, found everyone in his life that had offended him, anyone that had hurt him, and that he would have offered them forgiveness, that he would have had the same heart as the king. But what do we find? we find him go out, going out and finding another servant that owed him 100 silver coins. You have to ask, how much is that? How much does that guy owe him? Well, scholars would say this. They would say it was just a little bit more than $5,000. Doesn't that just blow you away? Here's a guy that owed billions of dollars And he goes out and finds a guy that owes him 5,000. And rather than giving him the same forgiveness, the same freedom, he begins to choke him and demand the payment. And not only does he do that, but he has him thrown into prison. He doesn't sell him into slavery so he can have an opportunity to repay the debt, but he throws him into prison. Man, the servants, when they hear about this, they're like, you gotta be kidding me. We're going to the king. And they go to the king, and they tell the king the story, and the king gets so furious that he hands this man over to the jailers to be tortured until he would pay them out back, and that's not going to happen. You have to ask, what is the point of the story? What is it that Jesus is really trying to teach here? Well, it's in verse 35. Look right there at the end of the chapter. It says, this is how your heavenly Father will treat each of you 
unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. And I'll tell you this week, as I was preparing this message, that verse jumped off the page. Because we have to ask, who do we have unforgiveness towards? Who in my life has hurt me or harmed me in such a way that I've been holding on to this and I've been unwilling to forgive them? And Jesus very clearly says here, if you choose to do that, your Father in heaven won't forgive you. You might say, well, Todd, this is an isolated teaching. This got tagged on at the end of the story. Well, let me remind you of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, this, follow along. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sin. Here's what I want you to think about with me. Forgiveness is something that we don't get to manage any way that we see fit. I mean, I really want you to hear that. We don't get to determine who we're going to forgive and who we're not going to forgive, who we think is deserving of our empathy and who is not. I mean, this is not something that we authored. This is not something that originated with us. It was accomplished on the cross. When Jesus came to bring freedom and forgiveness, he didn't come to do it just for us. He came to do it for the world. And so now as believers, we are obligated to make sure that the world understands the power of forgiveness. You know, when we forgive someone, really what we're saying to them is we are not, or I am not going to hold you responsible for that any longer. We're cutting the tie. We're not making them responsible to us. We're saying we care more about the relationship than we do what happened, the hurt that I may experience. I really want you to know that really in Christ we have power when we forgive other people. And I want to say this too. I understand that there is a continuum here. You know, it's one thing to leave the parking lot today and to have someone pull in front of you, cut you off, and for you to say, you know, I'm going to forgive that person. I'm not going to chase them down and tell them the error of their ways. It's quite another thing for people who have been hurt physically or sexually in life. You know, those types of things to forgive are very, very difficult. And I, I want you to understand I empathize in that. I want you to understand, you know, I, I can't completely understand the journey that you've traveled, but I do understand the power of forgiveness. And when we put forgiveness on display, when we are willing to offer to other people in life, man, God is glorified. The kingdom of God starts to really take shape around us, and the world notice. The world takes notice of it. They look at these type of offerings, and they say, how in the world, why would you forgive someone that? Why would you forgive that offense? Why would you be willing to not seek revenge? Or why would you be willing to give up hatred in your heart? I want to let you know there's power in forgiveness. I don't know if you saw this, but this last Easter, there was an incident that happened in our nation that was a little overwhelming. There was a man named Robert Godwin who was just uh, leaving his Easter celebration in his church, traveling the streets of Cleveland, Ohio, and he was randomly killed. He was killed by a man that had evil in his heart. He, he was killed by a man that didn't know him, but decided that that day he would go up and choose someone to kill. And not only would he kill him, but he would videotape the killing. And I want you to know, man, when, when I read the story, I just was overwhelmed. Like, Lord, what in the world? Why would someone do something like that? But God had a plan. And God does have a purpose. And his children are really the part of the story that maybe you haven't heard. But it was his children who came out and said, we are willing to forgive that individual that murdered our father. We are willing not to hold them responsible to us. We want to offer them forgiveness. And I want to show you this clip from CNN, and I want you to watch Anderson Cooper as he's trying to put this together as these children 
of this individual that was killed are interviewed. Check this video out. The thing that I would take away the most with my father is he taught us about God, how to fear yes. God, how to love God, and how to forgive. Yes. And each one of us forgive the killer, the murderer. You do. His, we we do. want to wrap our arms around we him. We yes. absolutely do. We don't. I, I honestly can say right now that I hold no, no animosity against in my heart against this man because I know that he he's a sick. sick individual. I know that, you know, because of his sickness, whatever evil overtook him that caused him to do this to my dad is not him. It, it wouldn't be something he would typically do. And I promise you, I could not do that if I did not know God, if I didn't know him as my God and my savior, I could not forgive that man. And I feel no animosity against him at all. I actually, I feel sadness in my heart for, for this him. man. I do, wow. I feel yes, real sad. All of us. And we wanna, you know, we lost our dad, but this mother lost her son, um, lost her children. His children lost their dad. That's and incredible, the girl Tanya, that, that you're thinking you about know, that, even in your time of grief, that you're thinking just, about them. It's just, it's just what our parents taught did. Us. But it wasn't that they just taught us. They didn't talk it. They did they it. They lived it. They lived it. Like they lived people would do things to us, and we would say, "Dad, are you gonna really forgive them, really?" And he would say, "Yes, we have to." So, my dad would be really proud of us. And he would want this from us. He would. And he would say, Tanya, forgive them because they know not what they do. Wow. I've been watching that all week long. And I tell you, each time I watch it, you see the power in it. And the world is looking at this and going, why in the world would these kids do that? I mean, to the point that they would say, you know, man, we understand that now these children have lost their father because this man killed himself as the police sought him. And you just look at their heart and you look at forgiveness and, and as the world sees something like this, as it's put on display, you just have to say, wow, God, that is powerful. I love the part of the video where they said, the, the children just said, this is what our parents taught us. I wanna let you know that God is teaching us the power of forgiveness. And as we continue to learn its power, as we watch it unfold, God's glory gets elevated. Relationships have healing. A person isn't tied to an experience or an individual, but they get a walk in freedom. Can you imagine if these kids would have just harbored hatred and would have desired for the rest of their life just every day to allow repayment some type of consequence for this behavior. I mean, I never think that they probably would have got that met. But they chose because their dad had taught them, their father had taught them, that freedom is the way, that there is power in it. And freedom doesn't mean forgetting. I want to let you know, I believe these kids every day will think about their father. They'll remember even the random evilness in this event where his life was taken. But once again, there's freedom for them. There's peace in it. So, so we've talked a lot about the why, why we should forgive. Now let's talk about some principles. So some things that we can kind of put into action to think about, man, this, this is how we can forgive. And here's the first one. I want you to know that you can't forgive until you understand how much you've been forgiven. I mean, I want to let you know this is the first step. And there's no steps before this. In fact, this is the first step, and it is the step. I mean, this is the reason that, jo that Jesus taught this story. And Jesus taught this story about this amount that was owed so that these followers would understand how much they owed. I mean, when you read this and you think about, man, this guy owing hundreds of billions of dollars. And I don't know when's the last time you evaluated your life. I don't know when's the last time you thought about when you came to Christ and you thought about your debt load. You thought about all the things that you've done in your life, the ways that you had fallen short, the things that you wish you could do over, that you could do better. 
and that you remember that Jesus said, you know what, you don't have to wait. Come now. I want to cancel your debt. We will never truly understand how to forgive until we understand how much we're forgiven. This is the second one. Refuse to let the hurt live on and on and on. I don't know if you've ever sat with someone who's been hurt in life and you've tried to talk through that pain that they experienced. You've tried to think through it with them. You've tried to tell them ways that you would like for them to experience freedom and peace and not have to replay it again and again in their minds and allow it to be true in just thinking about it every day in their life. You want freedom for them. And I want to tell you this. You have to remember this. When we are unforgiving, it actually ties us to an individual. We're waiting for something. This is why so many families have problems. They have problems because they're waiting for someone in the family to actually own up to what they've done, to come and ask for forgiveness. And there are some of you probably here today who are waiting on that, either from someone in your family, from a friend. And I want to tell you today, as much as I wish it would come for you, it may never come. They may not understand how to do it. They may refuse to do it. But if you hold unforgiveness in your heart because of it, it is going to tie you to the person that you actually don't want to be tied to. And so the way that you break the tie, the way that you break the power is by offering forgiveness to them. And then Christ gets to be the one who brings healing. That person may not be able to bring healing in your life. You may still be waiting for it. I just want to encourage you, don't let the hurt live on and on and on. Don't let them have another day. Don't let it have another day. But be willing to offer forgiveness so you can experience peace. Here's the third. Let God be the justice maker. I want to tell you, no one is going to defend you better in life than God. No one is going to defend you better. God understands your pain. He knows the hurt that you've went through. And hear me say, he will hold all of us accountable. He will hold us accountable for the way we treat each other. He will hold us accountable for the way we live our life. And God is and was in the middle of any hurtful experience that we've went through. And there's part of it, honestly, for some of us, we go, Todd, how can you say that? I mean, you really don't know what happened to me. And it was so painful, and I don't know how God could have been in the middle of it. I don't know how God is going to allow justice to be established. Well, I want to remind you of the story of Joseph, a character I love in the Bible. It's actually in the last chapters of Genesis, and you can go out and read that again. But Joseph had this interesting life full of ups and downs, that there were so many things that happened in Joseph's life, so many low moments where surely he was going, God, are you serious? Here I am again? I mean, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was accused of something that he didn't do, thrown in prison because of it, and forgotten in prison. I'm sure there were many days that just went, God, seriously? I mean, when is the season going to come that you're going to actually allow me to be vindicated, to be able to be on top. But God, in his time, gives Joseph the ability to develop a strategy and to lead the world out of a severe famine. God places him in charge of Egypt. He begins to develop this strategy to allow the the country of Egypt and the nations surrounding it to experience what it's like to live through that, to persevere. His brothers come to him seeking food. They don't recognize it's him. He forgives them for what they've done to him. They say, he says, Joseph says, go back and get dad, bring him, bring all your relatives. We'll live in this land and we'll experience really fruitfulness and abundance in the midst of this famine. They bring the families, and then one day, his father dies. And it's there that the brothers get back together and go, you know, it's been a good run. (laughs) Joseph's forgiven us. 
But now dad's gone. I'm not sure he's going to forgive us now. And they fear for their lives. And look what is recorded in Genesis. In verses 19 and 20, it says this, Joseph's words, do not be afraid. Look at this. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I just want to tell you, there are some of you who went through experience and you go, Lord, there's no way you're on the throne. There's no way you saw this one. You couldn't have. You missed this. And I want to tell you, God didn't miss it. And God may have been fortifying something in you in the midst of this hard season that he's going to bring to his glory. I want you to trust him in the process. God is faithful. He is just. He will see you through. Here's the last one. Forgiveness is an event and a process. Forgiveness is an event in life. You can't just say, you know, I know that was a painful thing that I experienced. I know that was a difficult day. I'm just going to forget about it. I'm going to forget about it, and eventually I'll get to the point where I don't remember it anymore. I don't believe God has created us to do that. God's created us to forgive so we can experience a day of peace. And forgiveness means that you and I have to put it into action. And it may be that you have to go have a face-to-face -face with someone who's hurt you. And you may have to say to them, even though they don't understand it, I want you to know that I forgive you for this difficult experience. I'm not holding you responsible for that anymore. It may be that you need to write them a letter or you need to get on the phone with them. But I want to tell you, you need to make it memorable. It has to be an event in life. It has to have an action, a component of action to it. And so recognize the power in the event, the power to sit down and reconcile and bring that relationship back. But I also want you to know this, that it's a process. That sometimes even when we sit down and we've offered forgiveness, that it's going to take time. It's going to take time for God to keep doing his good work of healing. It's going to take time for us to come to a place where we really feel like, now I've forgiven. Sometimes you have to say the words, and sometimes your heart catches up through time. But God will keep giving you the courage. He'll give you the strength. Because I believe this. I believe forgiveness is one of the most powerful things we have to give to one another. And so don't withhold it. Don't hang on to it. Don't let those relationships continue in chaos and disunity. But be willing to let God bring that together. And here's what I want to say today, too. There are some of you who have never experienced the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. I mean, the truth is you've been living your life. You've been trying to do what's maybe even right in your eyes. But you know you carry a lot of guilt. You, you know there's a lot of things that you've done in life that you're not proud of. And I want to let you know Jesus died for your sins and mine. And he died that he could offer us forgiveness and give us freedom as much as the king ripped up that debt and threw it away, Christ wants to cancel your debt and make you free. And so if that's you today, I just want to encourage you to be willing to pray this prayer. I want to ask everyone if you'd bow your heads, if you'd close your eyes. And for those of you who need to pray this prayer, I want you to do this. I want you to be bold today. I want you to be willing to receive what Christ has to offer. And so all you need to do is just pray in the stillness of your heart these words. I'll lead you. Be willing to accept Christ's gift. Father, I thank you for this message. I, I thank you for the power of forgiveness. I thank you, Lord, that you chose not to hold me responsible for all the things that I've done in life that fell short of how you created me to live. And Lord, I'm just grateful that you're willing to wipe my slate clean. You're willing to allow me to start a new life even though I don't deserve it. So Father, I want to accept that today, that invitation. I want you to forgive me. I want you to teach me how to forgive other people so I can live the way you created me to live. You know, if you prayed that prayer with everyone's head still bowed, with their eyes still closed, if you prayed that prayer and you want to declare that, that 
to be a part of your life, to accept that forgiveness that Christ offers. I just want you to raise your hand right now. Just raise it and raise it high, keep it up. Just say, Lord, this is me. I'm declaring today that I want to experience what it means to be forgiven and to walk with you. Praise God. Praise God. We thank you, Jesus. So Father, we come here today, this weekend, and we just pray that you will continue to do your good work. I thank you, Father, for the decisions that were made this weekend, for people not to carry that debt in their life anymore, but just to release it. I thank you that you have the power to forgive it. Now, Father, I pray that you would help us be people who have been forgiven much and now are willing to go and forgive. So Lord, would you restore our relationships? Would you allow us to look more like you? Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.